what's changed? You know, why is this like renaissance of startups in the enterprise space um, sort of come about? Justin, why don't you uh, lead us off with that? Yeah, sure. I, I think when you think of enterprise as a market, as, as a way to help company, corporations to earn more money, that doesn't sound very sexy at all. But if you instead think about companies as the groups of humans, groups of people who've come together to work together toward a common goal, whether it's they're working on a biotech company or to end disease or working to improve, the, the best vehicle that we have found to improve the human condition is groups of people coming together to work towards some common end. And the idea of helping those people, building infrastructure to enable them to achieve their goals more effectively, that's incredibly sexy. That's an incredibly powerful thing to do. And I think the reason that there's been a bad reputation is that historically, the person that you've been selling to is the CIO. And that, the CIO is not the end user. So you have these long uh, sales cycles where you're trying to wine and dine the CIO, convince them that they're that you match their set, of, their set of features, their checklist, but the end user is the person who gets stuck using that software at the end of the day. And the transition that we've seen the last few years is in the distribution model, where now it's the end user that's getting to pick what at work am I going to use. And because the end user is, is now the customer and the person you're selling to, you have this transition where you don't have to be sales driven as an enterprise software company or marketing driven. You have to be product driven, because it's going to be the best product that wins. And when it's the best product that wins, that means that it's all about the user, all about product design, all, all about design. And that transition to design makes it much, much sexier. So what you're saying is, I'd from say a that's product the standpoint, that's, right that, that's changed. The product's actually changed. Aaron, you what obviously happened? feel strongly about that, so why don't you jump in? Did the product change? Yeah, like, is, is the enterprise sexy because now there's more, the, uh, the actual product is a better product? It's more it's designed in a more user-friendly way? Yeah, well, uh, necessarily you need, um, you need the ability to have these very quick cycles um, in technology to be able to get competitiveness and to be able to get product improvements at a rate that will actually make products better. And uh, traditionally, when, um, when you sold or bought enterprise software, because of the, the, just the, the amount of kind of entrenchment that there was by you know, incumbents like Microsoft or Oracle or IBM or whatnot, there weren't enough of these cycles to actually improve technology. We went and uh, we were talking to an investment bank uh, recently um, and asked them what version of SharePoint they had in their organization. Were you talking to the bank about an IPO? Can't comment on that. But um, <laughs> uh, quick answer is no. We were actually talking to their IT team. So, um, uh, so we were asking them what version of SharePoint they used. And they were using, uh, version, uh, they were using uh, a version from 2007. And if you think about it, the version from 2007 was actually being developed in 2005. So they basically were on seven-year-old technology to solve problems that they are having right then um, with mobile devices and all these new kinds of ways that people wanted to share. And so it's just necessarily you're going to have a worse product if you don't have the, the, uh, the speed of cycles that, that begin to uh, meet the, the latest needs of employees and, uh, and of workplaces. Do you feel that that's a con consumer trend that's, that's you know, then uh, infiltrated the enterprise? You know, I, I mean, I, listen, I think once sexy, always sexy. So I think that uh, really not a lot has changed. I think the enterprise was maybe overshadowed by other investments in other categories that appeared sexier, and maybe for the moment were quite sexy. I mean, look at the gaming business, look at what was going on in online advertising. That's an expansion of where money was being spent and businesses being built. All along, the enterprise is continuing to build cars and put people on cruise ships, et cetera. So I think it's been happening. I think uh, you know to, to say that something has radically changed, I think, is missing kind of the major trends in how you build enterprise companies. When you look at client server, look at how software moved from a vertically integrated model to a service delivery model. And I think there are those trends. I mean, at Cloudera, we're enjoying this notion that you know there is no such thing as structured or unstructured data. There is just data. And when we talk to large credit card companies or marketing companies, they've been doing, we, we fall into this term big data, They've been doing big data for 20 years. It's nothing new to them. We just have decided we're going to call it something new, rephrase it. There are some elements about how they're using their data uniquely and differently, and we're allowing them to use all of their data. And that's one of the trends that we learned from the social networking companies that we applied into the enterprise. But really, their business is still running the same way it's been running. We're giving them new tools to mine old data, if you will. And so again, I think. Uh, nothing is relatively different, it's evolved, and I think maybe the sexiness is part of the overshadowing that we've seen in other areas of investing and other areas of uh, technology companies. 
I, mean, I, think they're... I mean, I agree with all this, all great points, but come on, we're, we're forgetting about the main thing. It's all the sex that's going on. <laughs> There's that's a lot of sex. Sexy, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think one thing that's important is what people want, whether they're investors or whether they're employees you're trying to hire into your company, they want impact. They really want to change the world, to, to, to Justin's point about what you can have as an impact. And I think when you, a lot of the consumer services are awesome and everyone uses them and they can very see, quickly see that the impact that that has on people. And I think with enterprise sometimes you have to see examples of companies being successful. You have to see, it's a, another layer of uh, misdirection where you have to think about, hey, I can impact this company, this com company can impact the world. And when that starts to happen en masse, you can start to think about, hey, I can have an impact on over 100 million knowledge workers, for example, just in the United States alone. Right, so those kind of numbers, it's hard for even a consumer service to reach those kind of numbers just in the United States. So people are starting to see the impact these technologies and these uh, companies can have, and I think that's what really but, but I think leads to their an, appeal. I think there is an answer to your question, and, and this ties into what Aaron was saying about, like, we can iterate much faster. And yeah, Asana takes that to the extreme. We push code every single day, which would have sounded crazy just a few years ago. But I think that's one example of a broader trend, which is that we're taking advantage of the internet as a new medium. And for a while, what we saw was, I mean, something like Google Docs is very important, obviously, but, but in a way, it's just taking data models that were around since the 1960s, the document, the spreadsheet, and porting them over to, to you know, Ajaxifying them, porting them over to the web. And I think what we're seeing now is this renaissance around really seeing what is the internet as a medium capable of, and reimagining what we're capable of in terms of our collaboration systems and other sort of services because of what that medium enables. I think, well, you know, before, it, so it's interesting because we're talking about technology, but when you go out to the Fortune 2000, they talk about their business. So we talk about the internet, we talk about different kinds of de development platforms. The reality of it is, at the end of the day, if we allow enterprises to not have to make these massive 12-month investigations into what their next thing to use is, one of the things that's nice is, for example, with Box or even Salesforce, I mean, I can try it. I can try it tomorrow, mm -hmm. and then I can decide how I, I grow it organically. If there's any one trend, it's the ability for enterprises to consume enterprise technology in much more of an incremental way. And so you can actually grow your way into a strategic infrastructure by trying it one, one piece at a time. And I, and I think that on that point, the, the, because the distribution model has changed, because you can have things like freemium and because people can now adopt your software just as a single end user, um, it explodes the, the total available market size yeah. of these companies. So whereas a good enterprise software business maybe 10 years ago would have 500 or 1,000 or a couple thousand you know, customers in the top you know, 5,000 you know, companies in the world, Today, you know, we can serve you know millions of organizations, you know, globally, and uh, and that begins to dramatically change the scale. As Todd was mentioning, there's 100 million knowledge workers in the U.S., but there's actually probably about a billion workers total when you throw in mobile devices that can now access these technologies. So it's a fundamental change in the scale and opportunity for for startups. And that, when anytime you have you know an order of magnitude change like that, things are going to begin to happen from a disruption standpoint that are very attractive um, to startups and to the ecosystem. I think what we've been talking about is really how the cloud has affected. Um, the enterprise. Uh, you brought up the mobile angle. I mean, that sounds like that's maybe the next stage of, you know, the disruption in enterprise. And, and I'm really curious, all of you, uh, you know, what your perspective, perspective is on mobile and, and uh, you know, where we're going to go from there, from here. So I, you know, I think that it's, it's like anything. Think about, think of, one of the things we have to do in the Silicon Valley is not think like a Silicon Valley company. We have to think like a transportation company or a media company or a retail outfit. And the argument there that you're bringing up, which is really good, is time to decision. And so if you can allow through a different kind of a device, or matter of fact, in many cases, it's, it's a mobile phone, it's a tablet, it's a, it's a, a PC or a Mac, we're able to actually get to decisions much quicker. I mean, let's face it, we're rarely without one of those devices in our hands. And if we have that information at our fingertips, you can make decisions that impact the way your business runs immediately. You're not kind of wedded to the nine to five hours like we were you know, in previous generations. It's a big difference. Yeah, uh, go for it. Oh, I was just gonna say that you know, the conference is about disruption and what new companies can do around innovative products and technology. And one thing about mobile that everyone lists off that the, the main fact that everyone knows, which is there's an order of magnitude more devices with mobile, right? So if you had one before, now you have 10 times as many. The one thing people don't mention that is equally as impactful in terms of what companies are trying to do is that for the first time in 25 years, there's not a monopoly on the client of the network. 
There's not, there's not a monopoly on the client of the network. So we went from a world where five years ago, 95% of internet connected devices were Windows. Now it's 50%. And in this room, uh, much less than that. Um, if you're developing for iOS, yeah. for Android, So it's a heterogeneous or... environment. And you, can't, you have to build a product for that environment. And it's a really disruptive. And what that does is actually, and this is why, so I, I agree that this is, you know, rel it's, a, it's all about kind of relativity, and this is, you know, relatively and, and kind of incrementally a, a more disruptive environment. But, but actually, that, that change alone, we were with the CIO of a, um, a Fortune, you know, 50 company yesterday. And because of the fact of, like, so when, when, he, when we surveyed um, what, what his mobile landscape looks like, um, the vast majority of incoming devices are iOS. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and what that does is, not only does it mean that what he has to support is going to be entirely different, it means that the kinds of companies that he's going to go interact with are, are entirely different. So he can't just call up Microsoft and say, how are you going to support my iOS? Um, right now their answer is, go buy Microsoft Surface. So what, what we're seeing is, is this complete change in the, the kind of expectations that uh, CIOs and IT buyers are going to have for the kind of technology that they're going to go that they're going to go evaluate and purchase, which means that, that there's now opportunity for startups where there wasn't five years ago or ten years ago because you could just call Microsoft and you could just buy the next version of Exchange or the next version of SharePoint or the next version of Office to solve your problems, whereas today you can't because of the, the heterogeneity. And it's it's great for the ecosystem too because when you have competition right now in the mobile platform business, you have big time competition. You get innovation. And the CIO has to deal with maybe managing multiple platforms, but the good news for everyone is that there's going to be massive innovation there and massive change. Well, your, your question, though, was about what is the cloud kind of architecture doing to enable this? So this, it really doesn't matter. The point is, I think we're saying, is it doesn't really matter the device we hold in our hand. What's, if you want to talk about something not being sexy, it's what's going on inside data centers, whether it's at Box or that Fortune 50 company, and how they're enabling this infrastructure. And VMware was a big part of that uh, renaissance, how we're enabling this, this infrastructure to make things like these work really well around the world. And so it's not the device itself that's cool. It's the enabling technology that is behind closed doors you know, with uh, air conditioners running, stacked in a data center, that actually enables all this to happen. So if you want to talk about what's not sexy, data centers aren't sexy, but if you don't have what data centers do, none of this is possible. Right. So that's actually one of the interesting concepts is what's going on both in the private re-architecture of data centers, so what are the Fortune 50 folks doing in their own four walls, and then what is going on in the cloud-based services that are emerging as well. And then the hybridization of that, that's going to be an incredibly interesting and enabling uh, area for us going forward. We're very much looking forward to that. There's, there's, no, there's no question on mobile that uh, mobile is a huge trend in the enterprise world, just like it is in the consumer world. I think there is a big difference between enterprise and consumer here, which is that in the consumer world, you, you can imagine a massive swing where pretty much no one even uses a desktop computer anymore. Where, it's, where all the consumer activity goes to mobile because you, you're on your device, you're interacting with your friends, you don't want to have to be sitting in front of a, a dedicated machine. But you know, Steve Jobs had this analogy between uh, you know, a, a, compu a laptop computer is like a truck and a, a mobile phone is like a car. And I think for people who are knowledge workers, where what you're doing day in and day out, I mean, most of our usage of screens even today, if you're a knowledge worker, is the 9 to 5 or 9 to 9 that you're sitting at your office. And there, it would be terrible to be using a mobile device. When you're a knowledge worker where you're manipulating large amounts of information, and that's what you're doing all the time, desktop is still really important. So clearly, we're going to have a mobile revolution. But I think it's going to be, there's going to be more balance between mobile and desktop for a long time on the de on, uh, in Aaron. enterprise than there is in consumer. I completely agree, except for one thing. Boom. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's, you're, you're absolutely correct based on today's definition of the knowledge worker. But what mobile does is it begins to enable a whole new class of worker that traditionally never had access to enterprise technology. And so that's where the billion now worker number comes from, yeah. is you know, we could only sell our software to a total addressable market of effectively people that went yeah. to an office, worked at a laptop, worked at a desktop, and that's where they did their work. But we're now selling Box to tons of organizations that are trying to enable field sales teams, 
um, people in stores, uh, people that are doing remote auditing of, of equipment. So all of these new use cases where technology was never at the center of this workplace or, or that, that worker's life, where now technology is enabling them to, to yeah. basically equivalently be a knowledge worker like anybody else that goes to an office. So that, that could have the effect of doubling or tripling the total addressable market for any enterprise software company, which is completely unknown and, and actually not really well modeled out today by, by the, 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 the software world. But so we, we might see that in the next kind of five years as being one of the, the biggest drivers for growth. But we need to bring sex back into the conversation. Okay, sorry. We? All right. <laughs> sorry. So I think what, what actually is sexy is, and I think what we're all saying, using a lot of words to say it, is what is sexy about the enterprise is we're enabling enterprises to consume technology like a consumer. Full stop. Well, that's a, a big trend, the consumerization of the enterprise. Easy. Just make it simple. <laughs> On any device, from any place, at any time. Well, you For know, free. For free, right. <laughs> I, you know, I think, um, Aaron, you touched upon something a little bit earlier that I want to bring up is that, you know, why is this a startup's world to win? You know, what's changed? Why is it that incumbents in the categories that you guys all play in, whether it be, you know, identity or productivity or storage or data mining, why is it that the incumbents haven't been able to innovate? Was that, that me, me? Sure. Um, well, I don't want to give everybody a refresher on, on Innovator's Dilemma, but, but it's, it's exactly. you know, really straightforward. The, if you think about the, I don't know, 500 billion plus in market cap that exists in the top kind of five to 10 enterprise technology companies, um, all of that, all of the, the, the dollars that those organizations earn come from a, a fairly legacy kind of model. And, um, and in fact, most of these organizations were built 30 years ago um, or more. And so while they're all making this transition, they're making it at a much higher cost basis uh, and with a very different kind of technology paradigm than, than any of our startups are, are emerging you know, into. And so if you think about it, um, if you think about the challenge, uh, being you know selling on-premise systems or software, um, you know through a legacy kind of approach with you know heavy um, uh, heavy sort of uh, uh, you know indirect channels, um, whereas in the cloud you can go directly to the customer. If you think about that world that they have to now move into a world of freemium and virality and end-user design and um, and a much lower cost basis for the technology, that's a very hard transition to go through. Whereas if you think about customers, they want, what, they want the thing that's going to take them into the future faster. So they're not biased towards one paradigm or another. They're not biased towards um, you know, one vendor or, or another, particularly in this heterogeneous world. And so that gives startups an, an unfair advantage to be able to emerge in this new world with, without any of the legacy you know, baggage and challenges that, that the traditional players have. So to some extent, it's just it's unfair and it's by design of, of ecosystems and, and, and the marketplace. Um, now that being said, the, the incumbents I think are, are buying their way into this, right? You know, with the acquisitions of, of you know, success factors or right now or Taleo so, or Yammer. So we're starting to see the incumbents really pull these technologies together. Um, but the difference between maybe now and 10 or 15 years ago is whereas consolidation previously meant that you might have some unfair market advantage. Today, every, you know, every day, every week, there's some new app that can emerge into yeah. the enterprise that just leverages some better capability or some better distribution or some better hook than the previous one, so, which means we're always going to be way, seeing this cycle. Why are, there the not more, why are there not more startups that, you're, you're highlighting an important point here, but why are there not more startups that are launching as enterprise startups? Think, why, so are they, think, why are there more consumer? I, mean, I think, you know, we think about this a lot at Okta. And given the, the legacy vendors out there in every category, all the categories we compete in, these companies were built up over the years, and the organizational inertia is all built around, and the processes and the way they think are all built around the platform of IT and the market that exists today. And we've talked about this on this panel. What's happening is that the platform of five years from now and 10 years from now is dramatically different. There's going to be an order of magnitude more devices, an order of magnitude more users, just like every previous generational shift in enterprise IT, an, or, an order of magnitude more applications. And we try to build our company, and all the companies our size try to build it around this new world. And I think these legacy vendors are still steeped in the way of the old world, where they could touch it with a direct salesperson, where they could do all these, these old school things, and it's hard for them to change. People don't like change. Well, change when, did, when, did you, when did Box start? What year? We've been around forever. So we, okay. we started in 05. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah. So if you go back, I think the question is, you know, why aren't there more enterprises starting as enterprise, right. uh, you know, infrastructure or whatever companies? If you went back to 05 and you were Aaron and you went up and down Sand Hill Road and said, hey, I'm going to go build this next generation storage, yeah. 
you get laugh. You know why? They're investing in social networking, online advertising, social. They, they didn't laugh at us, but they politely yeah. declined it. By the way, way, by the so, way, if you go back to that point, it was why wouldn't you invest in a company that at with thirty people could generate a million dollars of free cash flow a month? It seemed that was sex. So what he was doing was like, why do I want to go compete with the major enterprise vendors? Right. The reality of it was was because the major enterprise vendors were spending billions of dollars every single year consistently for the last 30 years on infrastructure. So, you know, part of this connects with the Silicon Valley's kind of ebb and flow of what is hot and what is not. And I think sometimes we, we get overly enamored with the flashy object and we run to those things and things that, that appear not sexy, frankly, are still sexy. They're just not as shiny as the new things. And I think what we're seeing in the balance of power, let's call it, in what's occurred in some of the large social companies and some of the large gaming companies who will rename, remain, <laughs> remain nameless, is maybe the bloom is off the rose there a little bit. Not to say that that's not a great category, but maybe it's not as great a category. And maybe the enterprise, has, which has always been a good category, because I always say you sell real products to real people for real money. And I think maybe that's the cycle we have kind of emerged out of that I think makes a big difference. And I think if you look, you'll probably start to see more investments out of Sand Hill Road on so, companies like these. Well, I'd like to hear Justin Dazer, because he used to be cool in the, in the so <laughs> He in still the is cool. World. He's the only guy so, with red hair. That, OK, so let's see what's the deal. Oh, cool. um, yeah, I think there's a, a subtler cu cultural answer um, in terms of the, the old school companies that when the, the leads of those companies and the way that they were structured from day one is about sales or about marketing. And you can't then later on realize, oh, it's moving to a product-centric world. We're moving to a world in which the user is making the decision and then retool the entire DNA of your company. And right. so th this is an answer to why this is going to be a startup's world is because you need product-driven founders, product-driven teams, product-driven in, deep in the, in the DNA of the company. And, and even today, um, I think the people who are starting those companies don't see that, that that's the opportunity here. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't see uh, Cisco and Salesforce and I'm not going to name names. No, but you <laughs> wouldn't see them as, or NetApp for that matter, as not a product-driven company? Um, and that's fundamentally the difference, that they weren't and now this new generation is? I, I think that is the fundamental really? difference. Really? And, and, and in terms of... I, I disagree completely. I think we're doing it in a different way, but I don't think it's one is product-centric and one is sales-centric. This, there's no way the Silicon Valley would have emerged the way it did had Intel not thought about how you put chips in mobile devices. That maybe, is maybe, very maybe we're thinking about maybe we're thinking about product driven in a different way. And you're right. I, I come from a background of like Google and Facebook, and and from this background of really thinking about product in a very very and design in a very very right. nuanced way, and, and getting down to the real real fine human level details of how someone's interacting with that software. And and the vendors you mentioned, while well, they're great at some things, I don't think they have the expertise in in, in that what I'm describing. Maybe, I agree. Maybe that's a wrinkle it, on the it, theme, but it, I don't well, think that's a core theme of, of itself. It, it, but Justin's we, on we something disagree. because yeah. um, the if you think about what the cloud does and what mobile does, <laughs> is it compresses a lot of the technologies that that uh, an organization used to have to buy. So for instance, in our case, we get rid of having to buy storage, or we, we get rid of having to buy a search appliance, we get rid of having to buy a lot of other technologies that you normally have to have in your data center. And the only interface to that technology is our end user experience, is that, is that application, is our platform. Um, and so that changes, that, that means that because you're getting rid of all of these systems, we've virtualized all of that in the back end essentially, the only experience you have now for a large part of, of your infrastructure is, is that end user experience. And the UI changes. is the product from that and, that, and, that, and that does change the DNA of the organization. It means that, uh, it means that you can't just sell this you know, thing with kind of buttons everywhere and, and you know, horrible design, i.e. SharePoint, and, um, and package it into, uh, into <laughs> one interface. That, you're naming uh, names, the two, Sorry, yeah, Exactly, so. we're, we're naming names here. Couldn't help it. The two aren't mutually exclusive. I mean, you can have a great product company and a great sales company. I think right. you mentioned something key, Justin, which is the timing matters. Like early days of the company, if you don't focus on the product, if you just go out and sell a bunch of big deals early and don't focus on the product, it's hard to unwind that. Now, now the example Salesforce.com was mentioned. I, I know a little bit, bit about Salesforce. I used to work there. Um, you know, for the first couple of years of that company, Mark Benioff, who's speaking next, basically took the product guys, put them in a room, and said, right. get the product perfect. Right. And it, it wasn't in, only until, until they had a great product that the sales and marketing muscle came along and like sold the crap out of it. So the timing was important. I think that was important in what you said. They, can't, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. But, but now, and, but I think the difference, whereas in, in the traditional model, 
that could erode over time, and then you can you could just focus more on distribution or some of the other mechanisms of the business. Today, but because of SaaS and because of subscription, and people don't keep re-signing up to your service, they will disappear. It means you always have to be focused but on isn't that. But it, isn't it what you said in the first three words, the innovator's dilemma? Yeah. I mean, that's fundamentally what it is. That's why Salesforce became what Siebel could not. Right. Full stop, right there. I mean, I think, I think we're going to see this pattern repeat itself for the rest of our natural lives. Oh, God. Justin, um, you know, you mentioned- <laughs> you, you, will, you will be old one day and yeah. obsolete. <laughs> this is already, yeah, yeah. He'll still be cool, though. <laughs> that is true. He goes we're, to Burning Man. Were you pointing to me? Pointing <laughs> to no, 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 not you, him. Yeah. yeah. Although, he is the Ryan Gosling of Enterprise. See, I didn't wear a, I didn't, I didn't wear a jacket in an attempt well, the, to be cool. The panel but, is oh. sexy sure Enterprise, so I'm just I guess hiding you're representing that. Yeah. <laughs> Justin, um, you've worked at Google and Facebook. Now you have an enterprise startup. Um, what's the difference when you go about building your teams? When, you, when you're hiring engineers um, versus being in a consumer-focused startup or company versus enterprise, how are you approaching that differently? Or is there, is there no difference? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, the, the experience that I had at, at Facebook and Google was being on the inside of the companies, trying to build things that were external and that people, that end users were using in, in their normal social lives, right? And it was in those contexts that I started as a, as a user of technology and as, as, a, as a person myself, not just as someone building things for other people, but as a user feeling these deep, deep pains and these deep, deep needs. And so it was out of those, those uh, experiences and that frustration that I realized the world could be a lot better. I realized that if we could improve the ability for people to communicate and coordinate, that not only would Facebook be able to run much more efficiently, but that's an opportunity that everyone in the world has. Because all of us, when we work, we work on things, we work together in groups, and those groups are trying to coordinate their collective action to achieve some goal. If we could do that right, we could improve you know, people's efficiency, not just by like 5% or 10% or double it, but we figure if you could have a real revolution in people's ability to coordinate effectively, then they can actually take on more ambitious goals, do more ambitious things, and, and we've seen that. You know, uh, uh, Travis at Uber just uh, talked to him the other day, and he was like, yeah, the way we run the company is fundamentally different than what we'd be able to do otherwise without mm -hmm. Asana. And so the difference when it comes to hiring is that you know, Facebook, a lot of the people they hired came directly out of college. There were people who enjoyed looking at their friends' photos, using <laughs> Facebook as a service, and so it was very easy to be like, oh, I understand that, I have that need. The kind of people that we hire often need to have already been out in the world trying to accomplish things, trying to do great things, and have met that frustration firsthand. And after seeing, after experiencing it, they realize how much better the world can be, and then they want to join this cause in order to enable everyone in the world to be able to, um, to do great things as well. Basically, just have them use SharePoint, and then Pretty much. they'll be ready. It's a sad state of America when <laughs> college students' biggest problem is sharing photos. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> but do you, uh, all of you face similar you know, hiring uh, engineers? Do you agree that that's what you're looking for? When yeah, you're it's a balance. I mean, I think the, the, the amazing thing about where enterprise is today is you can give people the exact same experience that they have in the consumer internet, the scale, the speed, the amount of, of you know, uh, you know I, we also push, you know, uh, uh, anybody can push code to the site live once it gets tested, then every, every uh, week the whole site gets uh, an update. Um, so you get the exact same velocity, the exact same sort of demand for innovation that you would have in the consumer web. I mean, the thing that was unappealing about enterprise software for so long was you're in this SharePoint kind of environment or this, this traditional kind of environment. You're spending three years on a product cycle before your code ever goes live and actually ever gets used by an end user. And so that completely changes. I mean, we do A-B tests that, you know, every single day on different kinds of features. So there's all the kind of dynamic um, elements of, of a consumer internet company and the same kind of, you know, scale. We're, you know, we serve 13 million users. So the, the uh, uh, but you get that added element of the technology is being used for some very powerful things in the world. Um, and you have a nice business model which helps things. Uh, and, that, and then it all kind of comes together to, to uh, create a pretty different package than, um, than existed, you know, five years ago. It's really nice to be able to get money in exchange for the value that you provide. Whereas in the consumer world, you're... You're sounding like Mitt Romney. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the consumer world, you're always having to do something like your customer is no, the advertiser. Value. Okay, got it. <laughs> your customer is the advertiser, and in a way, your product is your users. 
right. which just ends up in this weird thing where you're constantly having to balance like the yeah. left-hand search results versus the right-hand search results and figure out how, whereas yeah. in enterprise, it's, it's really satisfying that it's right. as straightforward as you provide value to a group of people, they yeah. give you money in exchange for that well, value. It's, yeah, people. it's real products to real people who use them to build real products to sell to real people. I wouldn't say Facebook isn't real, but yes, it's <laughs> well, well, people, much more direct I mean, people, dynamic. People want impact. I said it before. It's really important. People want impact. And when they come into a company, they look at a small team that is, is impacting millions of users. They can get their code delivered right away. They can go close a deal. A sales guy can go close a deal, and right. it material impacts the bottom line. That is, that is powerful. People want impact. They want to come to work, and they want to know that what they're doing has an effect on the company, the users, the product, the, and, and, the, and the industry. Are you guys seeing uh, more consumer engineers coming to your, to your companies well, or applying for jobs? It's interesting. Uh, Jeff Hammerbacher, who was at Facebook, built the data team over there. You know, he was one of the founding members of Cloudera. And often in the early days, we'd go talk to large enterprises about mining all your data the way Facebook understands how, what 900 million people are doing concurrently. It's an amazing thing if you think about it. And uh, the one thing that they would always say back is, yeah, but we're not Facebook. You know, we're a consumer company, or we're a media company, or we're a telecom company, or I'm a bank. And so the challenge is, is to take that, and I, I believe in that product shift that is new and unique in the way we're selling enterprise technology like a, and allowing it to be consumer in a, purchased in a consumer manner. But we've also got to make the transition from these kinds of develop engineers and people to translate it to the enterprises not as if it's Facebook coming to you, but if it's a new way for you to run your credit card company or your bank or your retail outfit. And I think therein lies kind of the interesting translation that, uh, that, that goes on. And I think that's going to be an interesting challenge as we get into this next phase of the deployment of enterprise technology. In the well, I think that's probably a good, good place to end. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Cool. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yeah.